<laughs> my my life has been like so much has happened in a few months that it's kind of like just each month seems like a year you know um, i also feel like since the pandemic time has like no meaning so it's been like the past three years have felt like 10 years but also like two months at the same time a hundred percent a hundred percent it's like um is it sharon olds who has some poem about like for the sick the hours tick by so slowly but the calendar moves so fast or something like that Kelsey, very happy to have you. And uh, to our Patreon supporters out there, very happy to have you here as well. This is our uh, first Patreon interview in a little while, or maybe it just feels longer to me because I also know everything is passing. Um, but we have here with us today, Dr. Kelsey Fuller Schaefer, and we know each other because you were my teaching assistant at the University of Colorado. Uh, so, you have long experience of um, the unique misery of, uh, of working with me. Um, why don't you start out by telling us a little bit about where your career path has led you since then? Sure. Well, I will say that it's not that big a misery because I keep saying yes. <laughs> Um, so my PhD is actually in musicology, um, but because of the state of academia right now, because not just the job market, but also because a lot of universities are being asked to do more with less, just generally across the board, that is the, the, the truth of academia and, and higher education. Um, no one really has the luxury of being a specialist anymore. You have to do about 10 different things. You have to teach a million different classes. Um, so I started with music, but I was, as I was doing music, I was also doing Scandinavian studies. I was also doing literature studies. And so um, when I went on the job market, I got um, my first job right out of the right out of the uh, school was uh, in Scandinavian studies, and so I was teaching Swedish language. Um, I was teaching uh, Scandinavian literature and folklore, and then I finally they let me teach the class that I always wanted to teach, which was the Tolkien and Norse myth class. Um, so since then, I've been doing a mix of all of those things, and I've finally settled into a. Um, a job that I really like, which is working as um, a librarian or a pseudo librarian, because my degree is not in library studies. Um, but it it lets me stay in higher education and it lets me do all of this other crazy, quirky research stuff on the side that I wouldn't have necessarily time to do if I was constantly in the rat race for designing new courses, developing new classes, applying for jobs, because most of the positions now are one year and moving every year and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm I'm kind of all over the place, but um, have, have settled into this kind of vague, sure, anything Scandinavian hit me with it. That's, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Sure, sure. And uh, so previously you were teaching at, uh, is it Augustana in Illinois, right? Yes. And yep. Then, in the Quad Cities in Illinois. Yeah. And then where are you located now? I'm at Fairfield University in Connecticut. Your home state. It feels like Colorado, state. though. It feels like Colorado these days because we've got all that wildfire smoke blowing in from Canada. So our air quality is terrible. It's just like Colorado, just like Boulder. Well, it's not like we choose to have bad air quality. It's just other places choose to be on fire. Um, <laughs> Although we often choose to be on fire as well. Um, and uh, just to sort of flesh out some of your background, one of the things I think is interesting is that uh, you've done uh, more work with uh, Sami subjects than a lot of people in Scandinavian studies. 
So um, you want to talk a little bit about that just to establish some of your background there? Or... Sure. So when I was doing music studies, I was primarily in interested in um, Sami music, and a lot of people have heard of Yoik. Um, I was doing a little bit with Yoik, but mostly what I was interested in was um, actually popular music. And so I started um, getting into like the, the popularized versions of Yoik as well as the, um, the political activism, although a lot of people in the Sami community don't particularly care for the word activism, um, but political commentaries and social commentaries as well as things like gender and sexual identity commentaries that are happening in um, like virtual spaces now, especially with the pandemic. Um, really really an interesting time to be thinking about the ways in which indigenous people are um, using pop culture to educate outside communities about who they are and how they want to be seen um, and so that was what my dissertation was actually in it was sami popular music and, and gender studies um, and i had a lot of fun doing that i ended up working not with with a musician primarily for part of the project but with a dancer uh, her name was Marit Sheeran Carola Stotter, and she does a lot of really, really cool um, artsy fun projects. She's based primarily in Umeå in northern Sweden, um, but she's been all over the place um, doing fellowships and, and teaching and collaborations and all sorts of fun projects in Iceland, in Japan, in Belgium. Um, so really, really a, an interesting, interesting friend to have. And then uh, another project that uh, I'm aware of recently is you have a book forthcoming from Simon and Schuster. I do. Yep. Big big deal publisher. Uh, October third is the official release date, which okay. I believe I'm twins with Patrick Stewart. I think he also has a book coming out October third. <laughs> so you can choose between me and Captain Picard. I won't be offended if you choose Captain Picard. Well, why not take both? I mean, you know, you're right. already at, that. you're already at Barnes and Noble, or well, that's probably an antiquated reference now. You're already on Amazon. Why not? Uh, why not pick up both? But we've got to have you come back and talk a little bit closer uh, to that about about that project, um, and whatever the story behind that might be. <laughs> um. So today, what we were going to focus on was. Um, some of these Tolkien Scandinavia connections. And so you would ask for some of these questions ahead of time. And so we looked over a few of them ahead of time. And uh, so what I'll do, typically we've started these things a little more spontaneously, but because we already had some of these questions submitted, I think I'll just run through some of these in about the order we were thinking about, and then maybe do like some follow-up questions after that. Does that work for you? works for me. Okay, so I'm also going to put in a plug while you're while you're doing that. Um, my dining room curtains here are not for your benefit. They are the only curtains that my 17 pound chunk of a cat won't climb. So I'm going to apologize in advance if he does anything while I'm here on zoom with you. Oh, okay. Uh, is that the uh, Gondor flag back there? That, yep, Gondor in that window we got. I don't know if you can see it Rohan in that window, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, the uh the the son of um is it Pelinor Fields or something is uh, coming into my eyes too much. It's like I, I'm I'm trying to think of some Tolkienian reference I can make about the sun being in my eyes, but I'll, I'll skip it. All right. So Adil had asked on Patreon, um, Tolkien stories are typically dour and tragic. And Lord of the Rings, the elves are leaving, magic is fading, etc. Does this overall pessimistic attitude stem from Tolkien's inspiration from the tales of old Universal and English Finnish, etc., or is it mostly his own perspective or a mixture? That is a great question to start with. Uh, when I am teaching Tolkien, I usually like to start on the first day of class with saying everything with Tolkien is, generally speaking, it's safe to say a mixture. If you're not sure, we'll just say he blended several things, and then you can just kind of pick from your Tolkien bingo card. But the big three um, are the Norse, et cetera, like the Old Norse, the Finnish, uh, Old English uh, literature um, and languages that he was professionally working on in his life as a professor. 
Uh, the second one is his own Catholic faith, being a staunch Catholic, right? He couldn't really fully separate himself from those moral codes and and social mores and and that particular like the Catholic literature, the Bible, etc. Um, and also his lived experiences. Um, a lot of people talk about um, you know his his fighting in World War One, his his kids, one of his kids being sent off to World War II, um, as well as his friendships with the fellow Inklings like C.S. Lewis. Um, but I also think that um, his lived experience has to necessarily in a lot of these conversations include the more mundane, the fact that he was in a, I don't wanna say uncommonly happy marriage, but it was kind <laughs> of an uncommonly happy marriage. No, I think and, that's a fair um, characterization, yeah. And, and his, his children too, um, he had, four children and they were the original people that he started telling stories to. Um, so everything from like the, the fantastic, like with the Inklings to the, the tragic with, you know, watching most of his friends die in World War I to the, just the very basic, like walking on the beach with his kid and he loses his toy puppy, right? And that became Roverandum, which is this wonderful story about a puppy that he wrote to kind of console his son who lost this, this little stuffed dog. Um, so those are kind of the the three big influences that I think we can see really woven through most of his literature. There are times, I think, where a particular influence will really shine through in a moment. But unless it's one of his translations or direct retellings, I don't think we can say that any one of his big masterpieces relies only on one of those things. I think all three are really, really present and and interwoven it can be really hard to separate them out um so i think the the dark and the tragic we definitely see that with um the, the norse literature of course ragnarok is hanging over everything like a dark cloud you can never really pull that that end times <clears throat> out of out of any of the norse literature it's just it's always there they're always worried about it they're always trying to prevent it even though they can't, right? And it becomes this dark, tragic cloud that hangs over most of Norse mythology. But we have the same thing in, in a lot of the Catholic literature too. Um, we've got like the Armageddon, the rapture, the second coming, like all of that is impending and everybody's gearing up for that in the same way that Odin is gearing up for, for Ragnarok. Um, although, um, with that dour, with that tragic, with the end times near, there's always some sort of rebirth, even if it's not clear, right? We, you know, the Volva tells Odin that some other god who, whose name they don't know is going to come back and Baldur's going to come back and there will be a rebirth after the end times. And I'm, I'm, I'm not a particularly well-versed Catholic scholar, but I know that, you know, Christ's resurrection is pretty central to that literature. And then also after the rapture, the righteous will be reunited with their bodies and the second coming. And there will be some sort of like afterlife, right? A final afterlife. Um, and I think also we can see this in kind of going back to that third, that third influence, World War I, World War II. Like, yes, war was a crappy thing to have to go through. And it tore Europe apart and it tore families apart. And and his family was not immune to the to the pressures and the the tragedies of it, um, but at the same time, I think Tolkien did buy into the moral um, imperative of war. Right, the great battle cry of of World War One was to make the world safe for democracy. Right, and and he was. We'll get to this in another one of the questions, but he was very anti Hitler in World War Two. Right. Um, you can't just let that sort of rhetoric and attitude and 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 conquest go unchallenged. So as much as there is this this darkness, and like and even in the grim fairy tales, right? There's always darkness, but you have to go through that to get to the happy ending. Um, and I think I'm trying to remember where I saw this. I probably should have prepared a citation. I think Christopher found a little snippet of something that was about the afterlife of men. And he was gonna include it in the Silmarillion, but ultimately decided against it because it was so unfinished. And because the Silmarillion was mostly about the elves and, and their thing. Um, 
it didn't it didn't really leave Chris enough to, to work with, but it was supposed to be this like Armageddon style or like post Ragnarok style, like mortal men die in Tolkien's universe. But then there's like just this this very very small hint that there might be something else coming once Iluvatar or Arrow decides, okay, we're going to destroy the world and patch it all back up again. Kind of like a seven, a second coming thing, kind of um, kind of like a post Ragnarok rebirth. Um, so yes, definitely the old English, the old Norse, the 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 Finnish, all of that literature does have the dark. So does the Catholic. Um, Bible is not a particularly happy book when you really when you really sit down and read it. Um, but I don't think we can say like yes, Tolkien's. Tolkien's love of the the melodramatic tragedy came from one source. I think it came from from just about everything. I think that's really well put, and and I think one point that you make there that's often forgotten is is anyone who's interacted with Norse stuff at all, there tends to be this kind of uh, people say, oh well, that's why um, you know you're so dark because you've got like you know the Ragnarok things. Well, Norse. The Norse mythos is not the only dark mythos. I mean, it, it. I think maybe people miss this a little bit because I guess sort of the dominant paradigm in which people reading or approaching Tolkien have grown up in is a sort of Protestant or post-Protestant, uh, very lightly biblical <laughs> worldview that, that doesn't have a lot of those dark elements that um, a more traditional Catholicism like Tolkien's did embrace. Not to mention, like you said, the very real lived experience of extremely dark periods of time. Um, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, well observed. So Dylan asked, something I've become increasingly curious about is the connection between the Norse mythical tradition with Tolkien's early goal of creating a mythology for England that lifted heavily from the Norse, which he ultimately abandoned. I can only assume that Tolkien, having fought in World War I, having watched his son fight in World War II, would have buttered up against Hitler's appropriation of a dramatic tradition and iconography. Do you think this played any influence on his creative process, such that he was, in a way, retaking something that he cared about? I ask because I know that Hitler wasn't just obsessed with the myths, but the language as well, at one point requiring parents to name all new children using traditional Germanic names and renaming places in East Prussia to bear German names. Yeah, so there's a really famous letter, and um, it's in, like, the letters of J.R. Tolkien, if you're interested in reading some of his like there's a lot of insight into his creative process in those letters. And the good news is that maybe a decade ago, somebody updated the index. So it's a lot easier to use that particular document. Um, there's a letter that he wrote to Michael while Michael was in military academy, uh, Michael, his son, um, during World War II, where he calls Hitler a ruddy little ignoramus, um, often quoted rather, um, rather, just Tolkien and, and his ability to, to insult somebody like that. Um, but I think it's also important to remember that the process of Germanifying Old Norse everything, the mythology, et cetera, um, for nationalistic purposes, specifically for Germany, uh, started long before Hitler. We could go back to Wagner if we want and the ring cycle and um, taking that the, the story of Sigurd and Brunhild and, and that we know so well in Norse myth and using kind of a dramatic take on that and also like really, really amping into the um, the, the oversaturated, um, not just operatic style, but also German nationalism. Um, so it wasn't Hitler who started this process, although I will say that Hitler did take it to the next level um, <laughs> in, in too many ways. Um, but I, you know, it's, it's funny, like even if, even if he said that he was, not going to write a mythology for England, right? We said like, okay, he kind of abandoned that. I don't know that he ever actually did abandon it because he does create a mythology 
and it is very influenced by like Anglo-Saxon um, and, and Norse ideals. Um, and I don't think his stories are particularly universal. So I think what he ended up writing, whether he saw it as successful or not, was a mythology for England. Um, so he, he, in the beginning, wanted to write something that was evocative of a, a pre-Christian mythology. And now, so for a man who was born in the 20th century, or well, he was a man of the 20th century. Um, I think he was born at the tail end of the, of the night. Anyway, he had very strong opinions about the Norman conquest. <laughs> And I don't know if this is just the British guy hates the French and will take it like as far back as he possibly can. Um, but he blamed the Norman conquest for the shortage of like real um, satisfying, sustainable Anglo-Saxon literature, culture uh, and material to draw from. Right. So when we look at British mythology, what is it? Right. We have these documents like Beowulf. We have the King Arthur stories. Um but it's all very Christian, right? King Arthur is very much a Christian king with Christian morals. And, and so if we want to know where we were at before that, right? Where was England at before that? What, what came pre-Christian? It's, he blames it on the Norman, the, the Norman conquest. We don't know. Um, and, and saw that as like, how come we don't have something as, as amazing as these North, Norse myths that they have in Scandinavia or as amazing as the Kalevala that they have in Finland. We don't have something that that old that we can you know, cling to and elevate and, and have a, a, a literary nationalism, if I, can, if I can accuse him of that, um, like what he was looking for. So I don't think he ever really let go of that. But how much of his interest in language was motivated particularly by reclaiming some of the German uh, traditions, uh, both literature and language from Hitler. I don't, I don't really have a great answer for that. Um, but linguistically speaking, I think we can say that he was really all over the map. Um, so if we look at Sindarin, right, the Elvish, one of the forms of Elvish that he wrote, probably the most fleshed out, it's very similar to Finnish, hmm. not German. Um, if we look at Dwarvish, Right. When you write it all out, it's in runes. It looks very similar to Futhark, but phonetically sounds a lot more like Hebrew. Um, so I really think he was kind of just a language nerd having fun with languages and also happened to hate Hitler. Um, and and, you know, some of his literature is accused of being Orientalist. He is very much, you know, a, a man of his times. Right. We have bad guys from the East with darker skin who have elephants. Right. We're not. We're not saying that he was like some ahead of his time moral compass, you know, for the 21st century. Um, but at, this, at the same time, like he, he was very anti-Hitler. Um, he did a commencement speech about the evils of apartheid South Africa. Of course, he was born in South Africa um, to English parents. Um, but I think some of the fun things that he did with language were not necessarily um, about reclaiming any sort of Germanic languages, particularly because there's not a lot of Germanic language in Middle Earth. I hadn't thought about that um, as a language nerd. I think Sindarin is the one that's like Welsh and Quenya is the one that's like Finnish. Um, well, maybe. maybe. But, but neither one of those is Germanic and you're right. And then it had not occurred to me that something that's very true is phonologically and even grammatically the little bits of dwarvish that you see do seem quite a bit like hebrew uh, you get a fair amount of those um, more guttural you know the <laughs> kind of consonants and i think there's even a plural in right which looks like hebrew and he did have to do a massive backpedaling after the hobbit um which is kind of one of the the big tolkien debates among scholars, right, is is The Hobbit a work of anti-Semitism because he used so much of these Hebrew tropes and, and a few little anti-Jewish stereotypes show up in the dwarves, like are the dwarves a Jewish stereotype? 
Um, huh. And so, then, of course, he did a, he did a massive backpedaling. He rewrote a lot of those aspects in the Lord of the Rings, right? So now we have Gimli, who's a little bit more heroic, right, and not just after money. Um, we have friendships between dwarves and elves, kind of like, hey, let's get over our our racism here situation. So, um, it was perhaps a a little bit of an an accident, an inconvenient accident to have the, the dwarves be so Semitic, but um, at, at the very least, he apologized and corrected and backpedaled um, and didn't kind of just keep buying into that. Um, I had never heard of that controversy, but maybe I never read an early enough version of The Hobbit. <laughs> I, I mean, when I say it's a contra, it's an, it's an older controversy. People don't mm -hmm. really still talk about it. Um, because he he did. He backpedaled, he fixed it. It's like, okay. Oh. That's news to me. Like I, I guess I can I, I I can sort of see how the controversy could arise. Uh, it's been so long since I read The Hobbit, uh, and I never saw those movies, uh, which apparently is fine. <laughs> yeah. Um I mean, I I respect Peter Jackson as a filmmaker. I personally start. would have a very hard time turning The Hobbit into 12 hours of film. Yeah. Well, and um, I laughed about the notion that Legolas was getting inserted into everything. And uh, I had this running joke when that biography movie of Tolkien came out, that, you know, there was going to be a CG Legolas in it. Um, and of course, be... D.A. Yeah. D.H. Orlando Bloom. There's, there's, there's going to be a CG D.H. Orlando Bloom in this interview as well when I post it on YouTube. Good, good. Uh, I haven't decided what he's going to do. I think he's going to shoot some arrows at your cat. Um, all right. So the next one I think we're going to do is George asked uh, about the significant similarities and differences of how oaths play a role in Norse mythology and Tolkien's work. Um, so the oath of Feanor and his sons and Tolkien's work came to mind. In that case, it seems the tragedy comes about because of stubbornly holding to an oath. And in Norse mythology, it seems more common for the tragedy to be caused by breaking an oath. I would actually kind of quibble with that. I think Tolkien's is very similar to Norse, but that's for you to deal with. Um, is that the case? And if so, are there other instances? And does this reflect a core difference between what the two hold as important or heroic? I I agree. I think that the the function of an oath in Norse myth and in Tolkien is very similar. Um, I think it's it's a pretty clear example of what I call a yoink, like yoink out of one and just drop it into the other, right? So we have so many examples in the Norse mythology where someone makes an oath, they cannot break it. And even though they regret it, even though they wish they hadn't, they are now bound to it. And because of that, they have to do something they don't want to do or face dishonor, which is worse than death. Um, so Feanor's sons do take an oath. That they will not stop until the Silmarils have been restored to the, the family, right? The sons of Feanor, they um, trying to reclaim these three precious jewels with the, the light of the trees of Valinor in them um, that, you know, the trees were destroyed by Melkor. So these are the only sources of the light. We really need to get these jewels back. Um, our father made them, so they belong to us. Um, and basically they destroy most of the kingdoms of elves and an entire continent in the process of trying to get these, these three sparklies back. Um, and, you know, about half the sons very quickly come to regret it and everybody comes to rue it at the very least. Um, so similar to the Norse sources in Tolkien, it's a, a an honor bound situation that you cannot get out of that is somehow marked with your doom right if you break it and then also it's usually marked with your doom <laughs> if you don't break it um so so generally speaking uh oaths are bad ideas in tolkien just like in norse myth and a fun example of uh not making an oath right we have at the council of elrond in lord of the rings right elrond who knows all of this elvish history 
Gimli, our dwarf, says, all right, let's all make an oath that we're not going to stop till we destroy the ring. And Elrond says, no, 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 no oaths here. We are not going there. Um, bad things will happen if you do this. And Gimli's like, are you sure? Are you sure? And Elrond's like, yeah, no, no, we're not doing this, right? Because had they all made that oath, they would then have been bound to that oath. They would have to stay with Frodo until the ring was destroyed. They all would have ended up presumably like Boromir, right? It would have slowly corrupted them one by one. They would have fallen to its influence. And then they all would have, as Boromir tragically did, end up being forced to break that oath by the ring's corruption. And we wouldn't be able to see them all kind of split off and do their own mission, right? They had to go and help Theoden and Rohan. They had to go save Rohan. If they were bound to follow Frodo, they wouldn't have been able to do that. Somebody had to get to Gondor, right? Because Denethor was losing his blasted mind, right? If they were bound to Frodo, they wouldn't have been able to go save Minas Tirith. So it was really important that in that moment, Elrond made sure they did not make that oath because they would have ended up just as dire as Feanor's son's situation. Um, but the flip side of that is like in Norse myth, your word is still your bond. Um, and I think in both of our societies of men, we have men who make sure that that the reader knows that, right? Like when Aemer and Aragorn first meet, Aemer says something to the effect of like, we men of the mark don't lie in this. We're not easily deceived. Um, so Aemer knows a liar when he sees one because they're, they're an honest people. And Faramir says something similar to Frodo when they meet in, in the woods of Athelion, like, uh, we don't boast and we don't brag, but if we do, we're honor bound to die or or perform, you know, the the boast that we made, right? When when Faramir is trying to assure Frodo that he is being honest with him. Um, so, what happens when men do break that oath? We see that with Aragorn's army of the dead, right? They are the oath breakers. They made the oath. They didn't follow through. Now they are cursed to this horrible undead state of just waiting until the opportunity then comes back where they can fulfill that oath and then finally like pass on, be at rest, not be these horrible undead zombies in a mountain anymore. Hmm. So quite similar. Yeah, and I think, you know, you look at the saga of the Volsungs or the Volsungs material in the Poetic Edda and the main damage is caused by Brynhild keeping her oath, right? But that she wouldn't marry any man but the one who didn't know fear. And then when she finds out she has broken it, like unwittingly, right? She just has to destroy Sigurd. Um, also, it occurs to me that Elrond tried to prevent the fellowship from taking an oath because he foresaw that it would be box office poison, uh, that we wouldn't have the action packed parts of movies two and three. And so, yeah. Right, it's true. What is the two towers without the battle of Helm's Deep? Yeah, right. So that's that's true wisdom. <laughs> I'm I'm in agreement with him. Um, George had also asked. Um, it is often noted how Tolkien's Catholic faith is reflected in the structure and history of his world. Uh, is there any case for or examples of that structure, history, or the roles of the Valar or other parts of his work reflecting Norse myth? Like is Melkor influenced by anything of Loki? I think he spent some time hanging out with the other baller after a teaming. Is Tulkas influenced by anything of Thor or any others like that? Yeah, this is a really interesting question because I don't think Tolkien ever flat out said, this is my pantheon of Valar and each one has kind of like this Norse or Greco-Roman character. But certainly if we wanted to interpret them that way, we, I mean, we could. Um, the Catholic structure of Middle Earth, I think where we see that most clearly is there is one God, his name is Iluvatar or Eru or whatever we, we choose to call him, right? And then below the Catholic, we have the Norse pantheon or just the pantheon, which it's still interesting. There's this seven kings and seven queens, which seven is a, there's a lot of recurring numerology in the Bible with the number seven. Um, in Norse, it's nine. Tolkien usually goes with seven. Um, and they have these, these roles that are usually assigned with, with myth, right? We have like Ulmo, who's the god of water, who's very kind of Poseidon-esque. Um, but Tulkas is our, our great warrior protector god. And yeah, sure, maybe that's a lot of, you know, Thor vibes there. Um, 
overall, I think his moral code is very more, much more similar to the, the Catholic um, than the Norse. Um, I, I think he was, he was trying to take what he likes from the Norse mythology and then kind of soften it a little and moralize it so that, you know, we didn't just have blood vengeance after blood vengeance after blood vengeance happening all through Middle Earth. He wanted something that was, you know, a little more uh, 20th century children's story friendly. Um, but there is a lot of like the Norse structure in Middle Earth as well. And with the example of Melkor, um, we often hear him compared to Satan, right? Like this fallen angel. But um, George is right. George? George asked this question? George is oh, right in that yeah. he is kind of this, like he is their doom. They know he's their doom and yet they keep him around anyway, right? Because of mercy or because where else is he gonna go, right? Like the universe is half formed or partially formed or is just finished and, and he can go and destroy all these other places as he does in Middle Earth or they can like kind of keep him with them and try and rein in the damage that he that he does. So he is a little bit of this Loki figure, right? Um, but there are other elements of kind of like Norse society that we see a lot in Middle Earth too. And uh, the big one that I can think about is like the social hierarchy and wisdom, right? And that's part of that is just a, I mean, it's it's a byproduct of class structures, right? Like the people at the top have the most education, they have the most wisdom. So we have like Gandalf is this Odin figure, um, but who else has wisdom, right? It's not the kings or it, it is the kings, right? It's it's the, the way that it works is it, uh, in, in Middle Earth is very similar to, to Norse myth in that the people at the top, right? And then anyone associated with them, right? The, the oldest families of elves are the ones who know the most because they've seen the light of Valinor. They, they've come from Valinor to Middle Earth and they've brought all of that wisdom from their gods with them. In the same way that in the Norse myths, like the 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 kings, like the Volsung kings, are claimed to be descendants from Odin, right? Odin interacts with them. He he shows up at all these opportune moments to help them make the right decision or to make a, a profitable decision, or um, sometimes set them on the path to eventually make the wrong decision and end up dead, right? Because he's Odin and he likes to mess with people. Um, also, prophecies is another one that comes up a lot. Um, a bit like oaths, when you have a prophecy, it's gonna come true in Tolkien. Um, see, like um, the big one is the Witch King of Angmar, right? Like not by the hand of living man shall he fall. So coincidentally, who does he run into in the battlefield, right? He runs into a woman and a hobbit who are, you know, the only not men, the only ones who have a chance to, to um, Kill him. Um, dreams related to prophecy, right? Who has dreams of death and foreboding doom? Baldur does, so does Boromir, right? Boromir goes to the Council of Elrond with this dream that's been haunting him, and both of these men kind of foresee their own deaths in dreams. And of course it's gonna happen, right? Even if they have to like try and figure out how that it's not quite apparent, it's it's still there. Um, right. Also, okay, this one's kind of fun. Um, riddles, the riddle that's not a riddle. Um, mm -hmm. What did Odin whisper in Baldur's ear? It's kind of a recurring riddle. They call it a riddle uh, in Norse myth. Um, Tolkien kind of has this inside joke with himself. I think this is just me. This is not written anywhere. Um, I can't confirm it, but I think the um, what do I have in my pocket riddle that Tolkien, uh, that uh, Bilbo and Gollum exchange um there's in the preface of the lord of the rings there is a um a, a note on shire records is one of the things and there's this um this line about the shire authorities are still debating whether or not that counts as a proper riddle um so i i think this is kind of like tolkien's little inside joke with himself about like all of these things we call riddles in norse myth they're really just silly trivia and if you weren't there you couldn't guess it it's not cleverness right it's right. Did you, were you in earshot of Odin and his dead son? Probably not. Um, so yeah, there's there's plenty of little, uh, like just these these structural elements of Norse myth that, that pop up in Middle Earth. Absolutely.
Um, actually, I think this will kind of connect in here. What, uh, the next one was from Elaine, wondering about Tolkien's usage of the term dark elf and uh, how it contrasts with dark elf and dwarf being used apparently interchangeably in Norse mythology. In particular, Tolkien's description of Ale as a dark elf and his friendship with dwarves. This one is also tricky. Um, it is certainly complicated in the Norse materials because there's not a great delineation of elf, dwarf, dark elf. Like, is a dwarf a dark elf? Do we really know? Is that confirmed anywhere? I haven't found the answer. Maybe you have. Um, but there, I think that's probably that ambiguity is why Tolkien decided to go with kind of the more like Celtic, post-romantic fairy tale sort of conceptions of elves and dwarves. It was easier than trying to create these Norse references as separate species or races. I, he uses the term race, but they're really species, right? Um, so I'm gonna be honest, I have never really thought about Eol as like his darkness coming from his connection with the dwarves, although that is perfectly valid. Um, you know, I don't think there's a one size fits all explanation for anything in Tolkien. Um, but he needed these species to be different and he had to be able to justify their historic animosity, right? So, so they had to be definitely different species. Um, could the elf interacting with the dwarf make him dark? It's possible. However, um, there are also other elves, like I'm thinking of Galadriel in, in particular, right? her whole thing is light, right? Galad means light, she's the lady of light, she glows, she's seen the light of the trees. Um, she strikes up this unlikely friendship with Gimli, which is like kind of this weird, he has a fixation with her and she tolerates it sort of friendship, but that doesn't seem to like dampen her light any, it doesn't seem to darken her light any. Um, so I'm not gonna say that your interpretation is, is wrong because I think it's a really compelling um, argument for where he might've been thinking in the Silmarillion. And I will also just, as an aside, say the Silmarillion is really hard because it wasn't published in his lifetime, right? It was mm -hmm. snippets put together by his son, Christopher, and later posthumously published. So if he was going to flesh that out for us, he never got to it. Um, so the Silmarillion can be really tricky that way. Um, but I always thought of Ael's darkness kind of coming from this moral ambiguity because with Tolkien, again, this is where he's been kind of criticized for Orientalism. Um, light is good and dark is not good. Um, so Ael is kind of a dark elf because he makes a lot of bad choices, right? So like similar to all of the, the Norse references where it's like, she was the most beautiful woman that was ever born. She was so light, she was so pale, right? How many gods are described as like, Heimdall is the whitest and Balder is the lightest, right? This light thing is good. Um, Tolkien does that particularly with women kind of in weird ways, right? Mm -hmm. Galadriel is all about light. Eowyn's always wearing white, even though it gets dirty, like why girl? But um, in the on the flip side of that, right? orcs golem right their skin they turn black as they're it's like rotting with moral decay right because the ring is preserving their life because they're these supernatural monsters that sauron has had a hand in making right their their evilness is what makes them ugly is what makes them dark um and so to look at ale in particular right he has um he's He's dark because he's a Mora Quindy, right? Which is the type of elf, his elf family. Um, those elves are dark because they haven't seen the trees of Valinor, right? They're, they're elves that did not specifically come from Valinor. They're a separate faction. Um, he basically stole a woman and made her his wife. Her name was Adathel and she was not Mora Quindy. So she was of one of the Again, wisdom and class, like she has seen the lights of Valinor. So he married above his class. And when we say married, it seems like it was maybe a not a whole lot of option or consent going on here. So like really sketchy things going on with this guy and his wife. They have a son together. Uh, what was his name? Forget the kid's name. So many names in the Silmarillion. 
uh, we'll we'll fix this one. We'll we'll add that in later in editing. Um, I'll have I'll have Orlando Bloom say it. Great. Yes. Um, so the the son, whoever their their son is, he wants to go and meet his mother's family, the Noldor, right? And and I think Turgon and Gondolin, maybe I think maybe. Um, but his father, Eol, doesn't want him to go, right? He doesn't want to let his wife and child basically leave their little area in the middle of the woods. And so he he like tries to keep them trapped and isolated and and separated, which is, by the way, like one of the textbook examples of like abusive narcissist behavior in a relationship. So, you know, again, something not quite right with this guy, right? And so then they do finally just leave when he's not there. They run away, the wife and son. They go to her brother's place. So this kid finally gets to meet his uncle, finally gets to meet his family. Ale catches up with them. And then they say, okay, well, now you can't leave because you found our secret city. And so you can either stay and you can play nice or you can die. And Ale says he would rather die and also tries to take his son with, tries to make the decision for his son, right? Um, moral failing, by the way, that we see with Denethor, right? Gandalf trying to stop Denethor from killing Faramir. You're not allowed to make these choices for your son. Um, so he tries to kill his own son, ends up getting killed himself, in the process accidentally ends up killing his wife. So really just a, a tragic figure who makes a lot of bad decisions. And he's he's a little bit different from like the the, like the children of Huron story, like Turin is another one of these tragic figures that's very based on Calervo cycle from, from the Kalevala, but mm -hmm. um, again, moralized, right? Calervo was kind of a jerk um, who did a lot of bad things. Turin was kind of just accidentally stumbling into all of these situations. Um, but Eorl here is, is a little bit closer to the original uh, Calervo where he is making these choices. He's calculating them they're they're not accidents they are like his own moral failings um so i think i think in that case it's we see these very norse like situations uh mythological and, and supernatural situations but um again tempered with this catholic sensibility or code uh, moral code um that's how i've always thought about his darkness if that makes right. sense I think it's all well put. Um, Payson asks, are we not meant to post questions during this interview? No, not exactly, but we had some uh, that were pre-submitted, so we're going through those. And we've got at least one more of those because Aline had asked. Um, all right, so there are a lot of, well, actually, okay, actually it's kind of Blake and Pauline together. So Blake, had first said, so there's a lot of really obvious connections between Norse mythology and Tolkien, uh, like Turin Turin, Bar's Killing of Glyrun, uh, the Northern Courage idea, etc. cetera. Uh, but what are some of the less well-known connections, ones that might not be very obvious, even to people who are well-versed in Tolkien and Norse mythology? Yeah, so actually we were just talking about Turin, right? Turin is um, kind of, so I will also point out, Tolkien did a translation of the Kulervo cycle um, as like separate from Middle Earth. So he was very into the, the Kalevala stuff. Um, and Turin. Published? Sorry? Is that published? Oh, okay. Oh, I didn't yep. know that. Yep. Uh, again, posthumously published. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. No, no, I mean. Edited by Christopher. Um, so he was definitely like Turin was definitely Kalevala on the brain. Um, but yes, there is also like the the Smaug and Bilbo. Um, how Bilbo won't tell Smaug his name and instead does this whole little riddle game, uh, which reminds me of Sigurd killing Fafnir, right? He won't tell Fafnir his name because he doesn't want Fafnir to call down any curses on him because we know how curses and prophecies and all that kind of stuff work. Uh, be bad news. Um, so there's that, um, lots, yeah, lots of those fun riddles and dragons things, uh, straight out of Norse myth. Um, but there's a couple other ones that I'm particularly fond of. And again, I, I tend to lean more Lord of the Rings just because it's not edited by Christopher, which I mean, I adore Christopher and I'm so glad he made that material available to us, but 
it's just a little, like one more step removed that can be kind of tricky to figure out exactly where Tolkien was going with all of these threads. But um, Saga of the Volsungs, uh, we have Sigmund's broken sword. Um, it breaks. Um, he gives it to his wife for safekeeping as he dies, and she reforges it for their son, Sigurd. And it's now this magic, unbreakable sword that that goes on to help Sigurd fulfill his destiny, destiny which is thankfully Aragorn gets a little bit of a better, a better shot at things. Uh, not not quite as as uh, doomed as as Sigurd, but still this broken sword going through that whole story. Um, we already talked a little bit about Boromir and Balder, right? They both have these dreams of their own death. Um, the connection that people usually make between these two characters is that they both have these very prominent boat-centric funerals. Mm -hmm. I would also point out, there's a couple other ones, um, the arrogant mistake, right? Mm -hmm. Balder is just like content to let people throw things at him because he thinks he's invincible. Um, if only anything ever worked that black and white, right? Um, and of course, you know, we all know what Boromir's arrogant mistake was. He tried to steal the ring from Frodo. He was corrupted by the ring. Um, they're also their father's favorite son. Mm -hmm. Their sure. brothers yeah. both get punished for something that wasn't really their fault. Um, so I like- I, I like thought of that. Most people stop at the boat, the boat funeral. And I'm like, well, why stop there, right? Um, so there's a lot of interesting kind of connections between Boromir and Balder that I like. Um, but I think my absolute favorite is, um, well, it, it starts with uh, King Throthi, um, our king who did Throthi's piece, right? That the later Christian scribes decided was coincided with the birth of Christ and the Pax Romana in the year zero, our one Norse king who is famous for peace and prosperity, right? And then we start to put that into, what is it Old English? It's Frotha. And then in contemporary English, it can be either Frodo or Frodo. Um, so the name of Frodo is taken from this King Frothi, right? And Frothi, the, the Norse king was of course, um, and this is in, uh, it's a little bit in the Poetic Era, but Hemstringa is where we see the most detail about him. Um, he was so concerned with the well-being of his people that he would leave golden rings on the side of the highway to test them. Were they going to steal from him or were they simply content? Did they have enough food? Were they hungry for power or were they like, were they good? That was his test. Am I a good king? Are my people content, right? So um, his namesake, Frodo, then finds himself in front of a man who has the opportunity to take the ring. Mm -hmm. And there's a line that kind of stands out in Lord of the Rings because of the way it is phrased so particularly when Faramir says to Frodo, I would not take it if it lay by the highway. And so that is this like three steps removed, mm -hmm. very specific reference to King Frothi's test of the gold rings on the highway. And it, sta it, it stood out to me like the first 10 times I read Lord of the Rings before I had any background or interest in Norse myth, because I'm like, how does Faramir know what a highway is? Right, this like 30 something year old guy, right? <laughs> All of Gondor is in disrepair. Their roads are barely functional. He's traipsing through the woods and he's saying, I would not take it if it lay by the highway. Like, cause can you find a highway? Oh. Okay. But it's this very, very oh. nerdy reference to King Frothi's test. I don't think he's talking about C-470, but no, I get what you're saying. That's, uh, that's funny. No, I had never thought of that connection with the, with the Frothi story or that there was some distant shout out between Frodo and and King Frodo. Um, I mean, if, if we're gonna name a hobbit after a Norse king, it would have to be the one who is very concerned about food. <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of true. Um, incidental question: While I, I check, so I think there might have been another question that we came up on later. Um, how many times have you read Lord of the Rings? You said the first ten. So, uh, um, you know, I I don't know. I I don't have like a a notch in my lipstick case for every time I've read it. Um, I used to read them every uh, every summer that would be like through 
you know, high school and through my undergrad, I would like read them every summer. It's like, yes, it's summer, fun reading, no school reading. Um, and then I had to take a break in grad school because summer is when you do your field work and your, your, like your heavy duty, your actual work, you're not in classes. So now you have to do all your dissertating and travel and conference prep and, and that sort of thing. So I hadn't read them for a while, but then when I was at Augustana, when I was teaching the Tolkien and Norse myth class, um, it was a January intensive. So we had like three and a half weeks. My poor students, they were like reading until their eyes bled to get through <laughs> Lord of the Rings and the Poetic Eta and the, the Saga of the Volsungs. We, we skipped chapters of Lord of the Rings where it was just Frodo and Sam walking and I felt like we could get away with it. Um, but they did a lot of reading. Um, and so for that, in preparation for that, I basically read them like three times in rapid succession, twice to prepare and then once alongside my students. And I feel like as, as part of that process, I kind of lost a, a small bit of my grip on reality and never quite made it back entirely. <laughs> um, so I have read them many times. Every time though, I find new things in them. I, I, they never get boring. Um, sure. well, it's something I didn't pay attention to the first nine times. I mean, you know, for, for full disclosure, I mean, what have I read that much? Um, definitely more than 10 times, it would be all the spawn, all the mall. I mean, those are probably more than a thousand times. Um, Robinson Jeffers Codor and All the Pretty Horses by the late Cormac McCarthy. So, but not told me. <laughs> you know, about five of his books crossed my library desk in the week before he died. Yeah. It was the strangest thing. I was like, oh, Cormac McCarthy, his name is all over everything. And then all of a sudden he died. And I was like, what did y'all do? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, I guess it was in late June, a lot of people were asking me stuff about Cormac McCarthy. And I thought, why is Cormac McCarthy coming up all of a sudden? And then I found out that he had died. Um, so I kind of regret that I never sent him the fan letter that I had intended to. Um, but I'm not sure he ever would have written this. <laughs> Oh, well. Um, do you want to take some spontaneous questions? I see we've got one in the chat. Um, yeah, sure. And I will just say thanks for everybody who submitted them ahead of time. I kind of just, there's just so much material. I kind of wanted a, a starting point of what everyone was interested in before just like, yeah, Tolkien and Norse myth, where are we going here? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, it's a huge topic. And your answers are great. Um, and you know, I think so often when people talk about this, uh, you know, unfortunately, it tends to take the form of like internet listicle type stuff. Like, did you know that there's also a shattered sword in the Saga of the Bolson? Like, but but it's it's nice to talk to someone who's deeply enmeshed in both of them and draws out, you know, something more meaningful than ballistical stuff. Um, and also emphasizes just how important, as you mentioned, his his lived experience and his 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 uh, profound Catholic faith argument. Um, I think you've, you've stated all this really well. Um, so now let's barrage you with other questions. Um, Cameron asked about, uh, talking of darkness, uh, Tolkien wrote somewhere that nothing is evil in the beginning or words to that effect, and he included Sauron in that. Sauron's transition into evil was prompted, if I remember rightly, um, by an obsession with order and a desire to save Middle Earth from entropy, does do you have any thoughts on that intriguing backstory? I'm going to level with y'all here. I have not watched The Rings of Power. Gasp. Um, so the thing about The Ring of Power is that they don't actually have the rights to the Silmarillion or the Unfinished Tales or anything like that. So they're trying to tell Silmarillion stories um, without the Silmarillion. Um, based only on like the little snippets that are available in like the appendices of um, the Lord of the Rings. Um, so I don't know if this is something that's really brought out in Rings of Power, um, but in the actual Silmarillion, um, Sauron is a servant of like Morgoth, Melkor, like all of all of these evil guys. It all starts with the one. Melkor, right? The the one Valar who went bad, our fallen angel, our Satan figure. 
Um, <clears throat> and he does, he takes things and twists them and corrupts them, right? So like these elves were snatched, right? And thrown into a pit and turned into orcs. Um, he's gotten Goliant, his massive spider, right? She's the, the mother spider the, that spawned Shelob and perhaps maybe also the, the spiders and the hobbit, although at, at that point he wasn't even thinking about any of this, right? Because the hobbit came kind of before any of the, the Middle Earth mythology was really fleshed out. Um, but I do think it's interesting that even, even Melkor might have had some what we might call justifiable goals. It's like good and evil is usually pretty um, pretty concrete in Tolkien because it's drawing from like the, the classic fairy tale uh, imagining. Um, but like even Napoleon thought he was doing the right thing, right? Like Melkor saw parts of the universe that didn't exist the way he wanted them to and Eru the the main god was like no no we're not doing it that way and essentially all evil came from stifling Melkor's creativity right which was mostly motivated by like power lust right um but it started with stifling his creativity um and so most of the evil things that are attached to him were evil because of him um yeah, no, they they did start off a little bit more relatable, right? And then power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so that that kind of the the motivation to conquer all of Middle Earth and change, right? Essentially the God's design. That's that's what Melkor and his servants are trying to do. Um it did start off because he told him no too many times. It's like a, a childish temper tantrum. <laughs> um between gods and demigods hmm. um and by the way you can stop us at any point once you decide you've spent enough time here um because there's some questions that are um starting to, to to get more numerous so so payson says and i think this connects a little bit back to one of the earlier questions um it seems tolkien had a strong mission to share the beauty and depth of pre-Christian culture with other generations and was pretty successful in that, representing the lore in the novel format for our times. Funnily, his mission was similar to Jackson in this way, and I originally read that as Peter Jackson, but he possibly means me. Um, any thoughts about that? That sounds like a question for you. <laughs> well, what part of it? Like representing well, all stuff in a novel format? Right. Are you... Do you see yourself as a Tolkien-esque figure wherein you have this old material that is you have to be a Nordic philologist to really parse it out and then you translate it and then you turn it into something that speaks to 21st century audiences and I would perhaps say cowboy have them all. So I'm gonna throw that one back at you. Yeah, maybe the cowboy have them all, but like I think that's the only example of something very similar. Um, where you're taking something from one culture and representing it for another. I mean, like to a limited extent, my translations, but I think I, I'm not creative the way he was, right? I mean, like I'm not making something new. Like I'm not, like Payson says poetry, but I mean like poetry reaches five people, you know, like it's not like, it's not like a novel or a book or, or a, or a movie it's yeah i don't i don't think so like in, in in my most um diluted grandiose moments maybe i would say that i was more of a snorry like figure than a tolkien like figure where i'm not necessarily trying to you know repackage something in, in very original stuff i'm trying to more like um just make something old approachable on its own terms more than more than recreated because um, I just don't think I'm actually that creative person you know I'm, I'm not a, I'm not an artist I'm not a but that's my answer um okay Jay 
says, you touched on this earlier, but how much Norse influence is directly from the original sources and how much is mediated through modern interpretations like Wagner? Because a pretty clear answer for that with Tolkien. Yeah, so with Tolkien, because he was also a professional translator and professor and um, like scholar of this material, he was very well versed in um, the original sources. And um, I, I think his, I think he would have been aware of Wagner, um, certainly, because who's not aware of Wagner? Um, but his his influence was directly from the text that he was reading. And he does a fair amount of, um, well, okay, so there's another book. You all might be aware of this one. He did a translation of the Saga of the Volsungs um, as Sigurd and Gudrun. And there are some parts where he's like, well, this story makes no sense. I'm going to fix it. So he's he's very much a scholar of the original materials. But at the same time, he also has this uh, this impulse to to make something not very tidy into a little bit more ordered. Um, so I think I think Wagner would have actually been kind of an annoyance to him. Anything that takes it and like does this grandiose like massive transformation of the of the original sources, I think probably would have been annoyed by it. Yeah, I think you're right. I I feel a very big difference in the sense of life between Wagner and Tolkien. Um, that's just almost unbridgeable. Like Wagner wears me out in a way that Tolkien doesn't. There's an anger in Wagner that I don't feel in Tolkien. Um, okay, and then Sam asks, are there, this is interesting, are there indications that Tolkien was familiar with earlier Christian school of thoughts, such as Gnosticism? Uh, Melkor strikes me as possibly influenced by Yaldabaoth in addition to the standard Lucifer. So I'm going to have to be perfectly deep. honest. I don't even know what Gnosticism is. So it's, it's deep, <laughs> I'm going to save that. For... It's deep cut B-side Christianity. Right. Yeah, I got nothing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Um, I'm, like, I'm, I'm not very familiar with it myself. I, you know, if if I had to guess, and again, take this with, you know, a grain of salt get your get your salt and lime ready um i uh, i think tolkien really did think of catholicism more as a living tradition um because he did live it because he was interested in kind of proselytizing it even a little bit like he tried to get c.s lewis to convert um mm -hmm. it backfired and c.s lewis became an anglican instead of a christ uh instead of a catholic um, but he got his wife to convert. He, he converted Edith to be Catholic so that they could get married. Um, I don't know how much interest he had in um, any of the like the earlier. I'm, I'm like, is it an occult branch? I I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah, he strikes me as pretty orthodox in his background and opinions. Um, but. Yeah, but very interesting question. I and I'm not aware of whether or not he he was particularly aware. Oh wait, somebody's got something in the chat for us here. They're helping us out. Uh, sim uh, simplified. Rising the spiritual ranks is done by gaining the secret knowledge. Ooh. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, I mean, gnosis means knowledge, right? Um, although, as Payson points out, Catholicism among English at the time was pretty edgy. Um, right. Basically, everything in England is edgy if it's not bland. Oh, you're going to have to edit that part out. Yeah, right. You know, salt, pepper. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, Lordy. I mean, oh. it's, you know, has England ever really gotten over the Reformation and the Counter Reformation, right? Because that's an even bigger question. Yeah, that's a whole conversation for um, people other than us, probably. <laughs> right. Yes. No. I'm not volunteering to answer that question. I'm just throwing it out there. It's like being, being uh, non-English in the first place. Uh, I have to ask Simon Roper what his opinion about that is. Um, all right. Any other questions, remarks people want to throw into chat? It's 
Kelsey, it's, it's been an interesting conversation. I, I've appreciated a really different lens on this question um, or on all these questions. Like I said, you, I, I appreciate you going way beyond the sort of holistical stuff about Tolkien and Norse, you know? Uh, not that I didn't expect you would, but I've appreciated the way that you Well, it's been fun. I'm certainly having fun doing it. I'm working on another manuscript that's kind of like this. Um, so we'll see if the publishers want to take it. Otherwise, it might just live on the internet as a blog post somewhere. Um, I think it's got a better fate in it than, uh, than a blog post. Um, I know you have some other contractual stuff going on, but I think it's something Hackett would take an interest in. So keep me in mind. I occasionally am able to manipulate fate to better the lives of, of, uh, my of mere mortals people. like me. Mere mortals, yeah. Well, I'm I'm pretty mortal. <laughs> so, um, Andrea asked if you could tell us a little bit more about your upcoming book. Uh, sure. Um, so it's part of a series that's published by Adams Media, which is a division of Simon and Schuster, and it's um, there are these um, kind of fun encyclopedia formats, but not like encyclopedia formats. Um, so it's, um, I actually, I have my, my advanced review copy sitting over here just in case we need it. Um, wow, so essentially what it is, is it's, there's an introduction where I kind of talk about what Norse mythology is, the primary sources and, you know, all the things that we know Vikings are and are not, um, because someone who's new to this might kind of need that background to, to get out of, to approach it from like the not comic book video game stance. Mm. And then it's um, just these character entries um, with absolutely gorgeous artwork by Sarah Richards. And so there's 42 characters, um, I think 30 illustrations, and it goes through like who each character is in the mythology and um, kind of the key story about them. So there's been one published about Greek myth. There's one um called women of myth that's kind of this all over the world different different women figures from goddesses to monsters to mortals um so they're kind of fun um it's it's really fun to work in a series too because you get to to build on all of the structures and work that other people are doing and and fit your piece into into a larger into a larger thing um but i've also really loved working with the illustrator as well, um, because as much as, I mean, if if you all subscribe to Jackson, then then you kind of know the the quandaries that we deal with when we're talking about Norse myth. How much armchair anthropology and and misunderstanding has gone into this thousand year old game of telephone, where we sometimes lose the the primary sources in the pop culture buzz, right? And it, I mean, going all the way back to Wagner and. And I think as much as that has plagued the literature and our understandings of the literature, it's also kind of done the same thing in the visual representations as well, right? And we can see that in the horned helmets. Um, but I mean, the thing that that has always bugged me the most, um, not just as a woman, but as an equestrian is how many Valkyries ride horses with no pants. <laughs> like we know what clothing looked like in That's Viking true. era Scandinavia, <laughs> And no one in their right mind, male or female, is going to get on a horse with no pants on by choice, right? Unless they've lost a very serious bet or taken a, a bad oath somewhere. Um, that's, that's and so works. working with an illustrator and saying, okay, no horn helmets, this, like, take a, take a look at this helmet that was reconstructed by the, the folks at the museum in Oslo, right? Or like, can we please have Valkyries wearing pants? And she goes, oh yeah, yeah, sure, let's do that. So, so it's been, a, it's been a really fun process of recentering primary source materials and historical accuracy, but for the audience who's who doesn't have a PhD in this, who doesn't want a PhD in it, who just wants the fun stories, but without all of the other misinformation that's floating around on the internet. Um, so it's it's been kind of a fun project. Yeah, a, a, a lot of that agrees so well with my own priorities about presenting this stuff. Um, so, so they wear pants or they wear shaps? I mean, you know, are we going that far toward equestrian? You know, the, let me find that. Where is the, the beautiful Valkyrie picture? It's I, super cool. 
from here, but I don't know if we get that clear of a shot of the pantaloon ski. I think on the damn great courses thing, I think actually their cover picture was one of those stupid 19th century pictures of a Valkyrie, right? And I, that I don't think- That sounds kind of right. Yeah. Okay. All I right, mean, so her pants- I look are at that as little like, as I can. In the binding there, we have this very angry woman, but she does have this kind of like Peter Jackson Eowyn style helmet and shield going on there. Um, and I'm gonna assume she's wearing pants because she's wearing a full shirt. Um, Certainly looks more comfortable. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, mounting a horse without pants on does sound like um, agony. Like truly agony. Uh, I had not- And yet it's, it's so common. In fact, it's so common with Norse imagery and even just taking a step back from the Valkyries, it, it happens with sometimes male warriors as well. Also, if you look at the very first animated attempt at a Lord of the Rings movie, those guys don't wear pants either, right? So like Boromir <laughs> shows up with a Viking horn helmet and no pants. Aragorn's not wearing pants and you think, okay, well, at least the horse people wear pants. Aemir shows up at the end, no pants. And so that studio lost funding. They did the first one, which was Fellowship and Two Towers. And then they were gonna do the sequel with Return of the King, but they lost funding. And so like one of the things that keeps me up at night is like in an army where the convention is to ride horses with no pants. How does a woman disguise herself as a man to fight in this army? Sure enough. I mean, yeah, there's some interesting questions here. I mean, I was just thinking, why are these so high, right? It's, yeah. You, For your stirrups. Yeah, a horse is pretty rough. Uh, Stella asked about the uh, age range of the book. Um, like, who's who's it who's it for in terms of that? Is it is it suitable for younger audiences? I would say it's um, it was intended to be eighteen plus. Um, that's kind of what they told me um, when they pitched this book in the series. Eighteen plus. It's for adults. It's not for children. However, I don't go into graphic details, so. There's most of the stories, I think it would be okay to read with a, a family with young children. You might wanna just kind of read through some of the chapters ahead of time um, because it is Norse mythology. There is murder, there is sexual assault. Um, so kind of reading through and, you know, maybe skipping a paragraph here or there um, or, or being creative and finding ways to make it make sense without traumatizing a child who's maybe a little too young to, to process some of the content, um, but it isn't. It was intended for eighteen plus. Sure. And Payson asks, is there uh, an audio book expected? There is. Yes, they're working on that now. The narrator is. Oh, what is her name? I'm going to find it for you. Um, she is. Um, I've I've never met her, and I I struggle with audio books. Um, which I just because I, I do better I visually. Um, Me too. I don't listen to a lot of stuff. Uh, I've been trying to get my name out there for more of that kind of thing. But uh, Avon Shore is going to be the narrator and she specializes. They gave me a bunch of options who spoke Swedish and Danish. And I said, these people sound great. Have them listen to some Icelandic. And they said, oh, we have this other woman who does Icelandic. I'm like, great. Sign me up. I want her. So um cool. So Avon Shore is going to be narrating it and will probably do a better job with the Icelandic pronunciation than I will do. Probably better than the great courses person. <laughs> yeah, okay. Cool. Well, I'm looking forward to that and we need to uh, get you back, you said October 3rd? October 3rd, yep. Okay, yeah, we need to get you back. I mean, back. If, if you get Patrick Stewart on here to talk about Old Norse, then I will take back seat to him, so. I think that's pretty unlikely, but uh, you know, I guess weird things have happened. Um, so, I mean, hypothetically, you know, I have sort of an in with Anne Hathaway, right? So, see if maybe we can get her to come on. Um, cool. Well, Kelsey, it has been a pleasure to talk to you again, and um, really appreciate uh, all of your answers to these questions. And uh, look forward to your book and we'll look forward to having you back to talk about it when uh, it's closer to being out.
yeah, it was great to talk to you all and you asked really great questions and fun subject to talk about. So happy to do it. Well, thank you so much. And thank chat you for, again after all this time. And yeah, it has been too long. And uh, thank you, Patreon, for coming. Thank you for your great questions as always. And uh, we'll have um, office hours tomorrow. So we'll see some of you back here then. And for now, I just wish everybody all the best. <laughs>